There used to be parades all over New Orleans. A band playing, people dancing and strutting, shouting and waving their hands, kids following along waving flags. One of these parades would start down the street, and all sorts of people, when they saw it, would forget about all what they was doing and just take off after it. There's three really principal figures in jazz that are the foundation of everything that's come since. Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, and Sidney Bechet. The black man's been learning his way from the beginning, a way of saying something about himself, something from inside, as far back as time, as far back as Africa, the way the drums talked across the jungle, the way they filled the air with a sound like the blood beating inside himself. He's one of the great soloists, great pure natural soloists, of which there are like five or six in jazz, like Monk, Charlie Parker, Louis Armstrong, Lester Young, Sidney Bechet. It's not that many. My story goes back a long, long way, further than I had anything to do with. My music is like that, just like the stories my father and my grandfather gave down to me. I have a theory about the great jazz musicians that I've seen in action. People as diverse as Louis Armstrong and, and, and Bechet and uh, Charlie Parker. They always give the impression when they're in full flow that if you suddenly snatched the instrument away from their mouths, music would go on coming out. You know, you get that feeling with Bechet. Oh, I can be mean. You've got to understand that, but not to the music. That's a thing you got to trust. You got to mean it. You got to treat it gentle. Bechet was one of the great clarinetists of the New Orleans style. He, along with others like Johnny Dodds and Jimmy Noon, helped to define the role of the instrument and pave the way for other clarinetists. And Sidney Bechet was very influential. Uh, before he ever left New Orleans, he gained a reputation, in fact, while he was still a teenager, as the greatest improvising clarinetist in the city. You know, some people, they got the wrong idea of jazz. They think it's all that red light business, but it's not so. The real story I've got to tell is right here in New Orleans. It's jazz, what it is, and how it came to be what it is. But I have got to go back a long way. He had everything that you want to have as a reed player. He had a tremendous amount of ferocity on the horn, one of the most beautiful sound in the world, and an absolutely flawless sense of rhythm and endless creativity and endless romance. And uh, he was the hottest player that I'd ever heard. Uh, you know, he just he just had, and, and no matter how many times you you add these things up, there's still some undefined gift that he had that was just, you know, in, in the feeling. That's really where it finally differentiates itself. There's so much feeling in the playing.
to this day, you know, he remains my favorite musician, and I listen to him constantly, and uh, have heard just about everything he's ever played, I believe, uh, and went out and bought a soprano saxophone myself and taught myself to play because, um, because of his impact on me. When I was a kid, everyone in our house liked music. When they heard it played right, they answered to it from way down inside themselves. If my brothers went around the house playing, they were out playing somewhere else. My father, my mother, and me too. We was all the same about music. I didn't have toys like other kids. I wouldn't have known what to do with a toy if you gave me one. Once I started to write a song for a boy like that, it was called Songs Are Me, Without a Friend. He had nothing and no one to play with, but he had a song, and he kept making that song over and over about himself, changing it around, making it fit. And as soon as he had the song, he wasn't lonely anymore. He was lucky. I was around six years old when I remember hearing the Buddy Bolden band. Everyone in New Orleans knew about Bolden. He was a real walk around man. I thought I heard the Buddy Bolden shout. If he forgot something, he played something else. He'd just make it up. There weren't no musician in New Orleans who wasn't affected by Buddy Bolden. Yes, I thought I heard Buddy Bolden say. Around the mid to late 1890s, the legendary cornetist Charles Buddy Bolden started to add this looser, freer, more exciting emotional dimension to playing marches and rags and, and hymns and popular music of the day and, and blues and use these effects and this exciting rhythm in his style for dances and for parades. First, he gave us the beat. He gave us the phrases. Do de 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 le da do de do do de 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 do le de 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 do de repeat a lot of notes, you know. Do de 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 da do de 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 de. You hear that in King Oliver, hear that in Bonk Johnson, the first the generation of musicians who did hear him and tried to emulate him. Today we take it for granted, but then that was a bold statement. If everybody's reading and you say, well. I can take what you reading and make up something better than what's written, but it'll still be based on what's written. Well, that was a bold statement. And then, and then not only was it a bold statement, he could actually do it. So that made it a new art. Buddy used to drink awful heavy. He lived fast, and it got to him in the end. Around 1910, 20 years before he died, he got put in the insane asylum. He went mad before they started making records, and that's a tragedy. That's another reason he was so popular, why you'd hear his name so much, the way he lived his life. The things he'd do got a lot of attention. Like I said, people have got the idea that jazz started in whorehouses. Well, there was a district there, Storyville, a few streets from where we lived. The houses in it, they all had somebody playing a guitar or piano, someone singing maybe. Tom Anderson, he had one of those cabaret-like places, saloons. 
He had practically everything there, and he had music. It wasn't a whorehouse, but he played whorehouse music there, and musicians would go there whenever they didn't have a regular engagement or some gig they was playing, where there was no party or picnic to play at. But in those days, there was always a party or some fish fry going on around the lakes. How can you say jazz started in the whorehouses when the musicians didn't have no real need for them? New Orleans jazz is the type of uh, music that was created by the New Orleans musicians from marching music, ragtime, church music, light opera pieces. Um, and the basis of the New Orleans music is a uh, Afro-American church type interpretation of a melody mixed with uh, the military marching band groove that's been altered. Uh, that would be a, a military beat, uh, like boom, 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 boom. Known as musician changes, boom, boom, a boom, 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 boom. Put the accent on the second, fourth beat. <laughs> uses the same organization as the military band and it has the clarinets and the flutes and the high instruments playing relatively fast. The trumpets are playing the melody. The trombones play lower counter melodies underneath and then the tuba is at the bottom and then of course you have the percussion and the cymbals. So uh, Norman's music introduced the conception of polyphonic improvisation, many voices improvising at one time. Will Marion Cook came over one night and asked me to go to London with him. He had a band, the Southern Syncopated Orchestra. Will knew I couldn't read notes. I could look at the page and see where the music was going, but I never did learn to play things note by note. I couldn't play that way. You gotta feel like it was all at once. We sailed in a cattle boat. It took 15 days and we were all sick as dogs. We got there June 1919 and played the Philharmonic Hall. It was in London that I met the famous Swiss conductor Ernest Ansermé, and he wrote a piece about me. There is in the Southern Syncopated Orchestra an extraordinary clarinet virtuoso. I wish to set down the name of this artist of genius. As for myself, I could never forget it. It is Sidney Bechet. Once the musicians started to leave America and go to Europe, they could function in a society in a way they couldn't in America. First, women, always important to a musician. Never think that a music, musicians have a, a connection uh, with a, it's a part of the social life, sexual life, all that is a part of the music. In America, you get killed for being with a white woman. I mean, that didn't mean they didn't do it anyway. Of course, they didn't care, you know. Somebody like Sidney Bechet, he did what he wanted to do. He just had to be sneaky. And uh, in Europe, they were more, more, received much more respect. There was a lot greater social freedom. And also, there weren't as many black, darker-skinned people in Europe at that time, so they were like a, a uh, novelty. Wanna take that wig I bought you and let your head go bald? Gonna take that wig I bought you and let your head go bald. One day, Will came to me and very quiet like told me there would be a special performance at Buckingham Palace, a command performance. That's what you call it. Well, I didn't know what to say to a thing like that. I didn't know what to expect. The way it turned out, the inside of the palace was like Grand Central Station with lots of carpets and things on the wall. Once we got started, we had the whole royal family tapping their feet. And Will told me later that he asked them what they liked the most. And the king said it was the blues number, the characteristic blues. Well, all right, then. But 
there was a funny thing I was thinking between numbers and looking at the king. It was the first time I'd ever got to recognize anybody from seeing their face on my money. There was this fellow I met in London. His name was Clapham, and he played classical piano. One night when we got through playing, I ran into him. We were looking for somewhere to have a gin, and we met two girls. Two tarts they were. Tarts, that's what they were calling them in England. We all got talking, and then we went up to Clapham's apartment. After a while, we started fooling around. Then Clapham, he wanted his girl to go into the other room. Well, I was with my girl. We'd been talking and kissing some, just fooling around. And I'm wanting to take things more serious. Well, the way it goes sometimes, and one thing leads to another, and she bit my hand, and I slapped her. I didn't slap her hard, but she was a little drunk and started to holler. And the landlady ran out and called the police. So the next thing was, we were in jail, 14 days hard labor, and then I was deported. And that's how I got back to New York. You're listening to Sidney Bechet's Centennial Programming here on the Real Jazz Station, WKCR-FM New York. Phil Schaff with you, and we're now going to play one of everyone's favorites, Maple Leaf Rag. It is just that, ragtime, written by Scott Joplin in the last century. And I don't know how many of you have looked at this 1899 manuscript, but uh, there's a very important uh, notice that uh, Scott Joplin wrote. It's not quite in Italian, but it's the same system of uh, musical instruction. This is not to be played fast. Well, they say that Sidney Bechet couldn't read music, and he proves it on Maple Leaf Rag. <laughs> Here's the number that all the musicians in the world love to play. One of the good old swing numbers. The tiger rag, the tiger rag. Look out there. One, two. There was a famous character in New Orleans called Black Benny who played around different outfits. He said to me one day, you think you can play? I know a little boy who can play high society better than you. And we went to see him, and it was Louis Armstrong. He played the piccolo part. It would have been hard for a clarinet and really unthinkable for a cornet, but Louis, he did it. At the time, I saw a lot of Louis. I liked him fine. He was a good musician. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a little trip through the jungles this time, and we want y'all to travel with us. That tiger's running so fast, we're going to take a few choruses to catch him. So I want y'all to count with me. Yes, sir. Me and this little silver trumpet is going to get away for you this time. Let out there, boys. I'm ready. Yeah. Sidney was never a clown the way that Louis Armstrong had this clowning, entertaining aspect to his presentation. Particularly in the later years after the Second War when there was the picture of, of Louis wipe, wiping his mouth with the big white handkerchief and singing Hello, Dolly. This was the impression that people got of Louis Armstrong, not the serious, creative genius that he was. It was his way of selling his music to the public. Sidney didn't have this, but he had a very dramatic way of presenting his music, particularly when he discovered that straight soprano sax, which he found in a music store when he was in London in 1919. This instrument was perfectly suited to Sidney's personality, this long, conical silver saxophone, and which he played at an angle like this. And what it said was, listen, I got something to tell you.
the shade now had the volume and he had perhaps a greater ability to play technically, both because of the, the nature of the instrument and also because of the tr sort of traditional role of the instrument. Whereas Armstrong would have normally played more melodic type figures, uh, even though he was capable of rapid technique and playing all over the horn, Bechet would normally do that anyway. That was sort of his role as a reed player. So he was used to playing fast arpeggios. And, and of course, the soprano had a greater range for, uh, you know, rising above and, and making exciting uh, uh, glisses and things in ways that were much more difficult or, or even impossible on a trumpet. So I think Armstrong, for the first time, really saw a, a, a voice that was at least equal uh, to his and maybe that had greater carrying power. So I, I think that, that was a problem. <laughs> Sidney did everything wrong in his career. He went to Europe in 1925 with the Revue Negra, which starred Josephine Baker, and she became a big hit. He never went back to the United States until 1931. He spent the, that whole time wandering about Europe. He was in Russia in 1926. When he came back, uh, he was a forgotten man. Meanwhile, all his contemporaries, Louis Armstrong, Jello o. Morton, Bessie Smith, had been recording and appearing and had made their names. He was, he was uh, unknown. In fact, at the height of the swing popularity of Benny Goodman and all the different bands, Sidney was running a tailor shop in Harlem. It wasn't any shop for making suits, just a pressing and repairing place, and we called it the Southern Tailor Shop. Things were pretty bad there for a while, and Tommy Ladmere, he used to help out shining shoes. A lot of musicians who didn't have jobs used to come around, and we'd have sessions right in the back of the shop. That was the best part. It was real enjoyable. April 18, 1941 is a very important day in the annals of recording. It's a session in which Sidney Bechet went into the Victor Studios and performed on instruments he was otherwise not known to have played. And he did this through overdubbing and create a sensation with Sidney Bechet's one-man band. On the Sheik of Araby, I played all six instruments. I started first with the piano, then I got the drums and soprano. I meant to play all the rhythm instruments first, you know, but I got all mixed up, and I grabbed hold of the bass, and then I got the tenor, and I was really done out. It was such a great story for the newspaper men. They raised such hell that the union made the company pay me for seven men, six players, and a leader, and it was forbidden to do it again. Sidney Bechet was the resident band in a little summer resort in 1943 in the mountains of New York. I can't remember, uh, Fleischmann Mountains. Uh, his, <clears throat> we, there was a review 
uh, we did a weekly review, and Cindy Bechet was the resident band, which was sort of a shock, because in those days, black bands didn't play in white mountains. And um, he couldn't get a couldn't get arrested in America. I mean, he was uh, he was one of the founders of uh, of jazz, along with Louis Armstrong and Charlie Roe Morton. And here he was playing for a hundred dollars a week. Uh, we were very we knew who he was because uh, this was a progressive camp, a little left wing, working very hard to get the blacks. In those days, they were called. They weren't called African-Americans, they were called colored people. To get them their just due. One of the things I remember about Sidney is the respect he got from his band members. I remember on the concert night, we just, some, a lot of us were backstage, and I remember being backstage, and, and um, Sidney came out and did a solo, did a solo with um, the trio before the band, or, or maybe the band took a break, but I was with the part, part of the band backstage, and Sidney was wailing. And now these guys had been with him a long time, and they were very good musicians. And Sidney started playing notes. He had a way of playing C above high C above high C. He played three octaves, and it, it's, not on the, it's not on the horn. It's not on the soprano sax. He would move the, 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 uh, the reed to a certain part of his mouth. He'd bite down on it, and he'd let notes come out and I remember Bill Goodwin next to me is shaking his head. He said, man, there ain't no note like that. There ain't no note like that. By 1940, Armstrong had become sort of an international figure, and Sidney was still in kind of obscurity. I think Sidney resented Lewis's popularity, feeling that he deserved as much popularity. A curious incident happened in 1946 when... Uh, Fred Robbins, a disc jockey in New York, presented a concert at Town Hall, and it was going to feature the reunion of Sidney Bechet and Louis Armstrong. So we came up to the day of the concert. I was living with Sidney. I told him, Sid, I'm going to go in town. I want to catch a movie in Times Square. I'll meet you backstage at uh, Town Hall. And Sid said, yeah, okay, see you there. So I get over to uh, Town Hall at 4.30 in the afternoon, and Fred Robbins and the producer, Ernie Anderson, they're running around saying, Where's Bechet? He isn't here yet. Well, the concert went ahead and Sidney never showed up. So I got home that night and I said, Sid, what happened? He says, well, Bobby, I'll tell you what happened. You see, I got on the subway to come in town and I don't know, I must have been tired or something. I fell asleep and I woke up hours later and I was just still there on the subway. By now it was late at night. I never quite believed that story. I think at the last minute, he says, I don't want to play on the same stage with that goddamn Armstrong. And he, he purposely didn't go. Now, I can't prove that. But I, but I know that he was very jealous. I remember he, he would talk lovingly about their recordings of the early 20s, the cakewalking babies and, and of those marvelous sessions. And then he would say, oh, the ones in the 40s, they weren't, they weren't good. Louis didn't play his parts right, you know. He did... He was okay in rehearsal, but when we came to the record, he didn't play his parts right. Now, those records sound pretty great to me, but uh, Sidney didn't think so. In the spring of 1949, that's when I had another opportunity to come to Europe, to Paris and another jazz festival. It was put together by the Hot Club de Paris. There were a lot of musicians that came over from America. Hot Lips Page, Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, and a lot more. And there were musicians from all over Europe, including my good friend Claude Luther. It was really interesting playing with Bechet because he taught us so much. Before him, our inspiration had been King Oliver. That was typical New Orleans music, but Sidney made us change that little by little. At first, we were a little bit apprehensive. We were saying, that's not real jazz. But he said, look, in New Orleans, they play a little bit of everything. It's not what you play, it's the way that you play it. That's what matters. 
Voici donc un des plus extraordinaires musiciens de toute l'histoire de la musique de jazz. Voici le roi incontesté du saxophone soprano. Voici Sidney Bechet. La première chose que Sidney Bechet nous a appris, The first thing that Bechet taught us was to blow the instrument in a different way. It's hard to explain, but I'll show you. For example, les oignons. Before we met, it would have gone like this. And now this is the way we had to play to make him happy. It doesn't make a big difference to people who aren't musicians. But for us, it was very difficult because we had to change our position on the mouthpiece completely. In the end, when I managed to do it, I felt a kind of satisfaction because we had a much bigger impact. It was more lively and sharp and a much harder sound. He was our torturer. We used to call him our torturer because he was so hard on us. Now I'm much older, I understand it all too well, because we were all half his age. I had to rethink everything thanks to Bechet. It's thanks to him I've learned everything I know. He took very seriously his role as one of the eldest figures of the New Orleans jazz movement, which had been revived after the war, in which I was a part then. He went through each member of the band and gave me a little report uh, on, uh, on, on each of us. He said to me that I, I, I was too nervous, and he could say that again. I was absolutely petrified. And um, uh, he, he liked the trombonist Keith Christie very much, and Wally Fawkes he admired. Wally paid, played in a, you know, somewhat in a Sidney Bechet way. I remember one thing, he said that the drummer tended to slow the beat down, and he said, you should never do that. He said, that's cruel to music. And I noticed all the way through the various occasions when I met him, he had this sort of almost Old Testament way of speaking, you know, a very simplified way. I think I'd made up my mind that Europe was to be my home for what time there was left. I wanted to play music for as long as I could. It was around this time that my brother Leonard died. I'd always wanted him to come to join me in Europe. He played trombone. I was always on him about it. He never made up his mind. Then about two or three o'clock one morning, I got a phone call to tell me my brother Leonard, he was dead. And that was the end of him, poor fellow. He was around 12 or 15 years older than me, and he was the one member of my family who had always been nearest to me. While he would have emerged because someone that dazzling just emerges, um, he definitely would have had a harder time, I think, in the United States uh, than than in Europe. And and um, you know that was always the case. I mean, in the United States, he was he had a tailor shop in Harlem. He was pressing pants. Uh, you know, whereas in Europe, he was playing music and and respected for it. Sidney was a ladies' man. A lot of the problems that he would get into would be uh, with his relationships with ladies, which would sometimes overlap disastrously. Uh, but I would see him when a particularly beautiful woman would be sitting in the audience. Sidney would lift his horn and point it at the, at the lady and play a song like Love for Sale or a beautiful ballad like Laura he used to play. He would make love and that horn. And there was nights when at the end of the evening I would Sydney I see Sydney going off 
out of the club arm in arm with the lady. He was always a bad loser. When we were young and our girlfriends were young, he was always trying to get off with them. Most of the time he didn't succeed. Now several times he banned me from taking a break. He kept telling me it was because I was tired and I needed a break and rubbish like that, but it was his way of getting his own back when things didn't work out with one of my girlfriends. Some of the guys in the band didn't like that. Personally, I didn't care very much. Anyway, what would happen was this. When it was my turn to step forward to take a break, I'd step forward and he'd stop me with his arm like that because he thought that was the worst punishment to stop someone from taking a chorus. Kalula was uh, one of the people that had a great infatuation for Sydney. And at the time, I was living in Sydney, and he was playing on 52nd Street. Kalula was appearing on Broadway in an old coward play, Private Lives. And uh, one time, the phone rings. This voice says, Oh, this is Tallulah. Let me speak to Sydney. She had this gruff voice. I said, uh, uh, Just a minute. Hey, Sydney, it's Tallulah on the phone. And he comes out of the phone booth and he says, you want to have some fun tonight? Tallulah wants us to come up to the hotel after we finish. So uh, get your horn, we'll go up. So we go up to this uh, east side hotel where Tallulah was living, took the elevator up to her floor, knocked on the door. The door opens and there's Tallulah Starkers, not a <laughs> stitch of clothing on. Come on in, fellas, come on in, get your horns out. I want to hear some, I want to hear some blues. So. <laughs> She climbs back in bed, and Sydney and I take our horns out, and we're sitting on the, the end of the bed, and we start playing some blues for her. She was living with her leading man in the show, and one of the jobs was to keep Tallulah off the sauce, you know, that she had a penchant for drinking bourbon. So uh, at that point, he was running around because they had a canary which had gotten loose from the cage and was running around this, this suite. And he'd run into the bedroom trying to catch this canary. And she said, Bobby, quick, into the kitchen. Get me a drink, you know. So I would go in the kitchen and pour her a glass of bourbon and sneak it out to her. And she'd quickly sneak it out and he'd come back in, you know. So we were doing this, playing the blues, sneaking drinks for Tallulah. Finally, after uh, an hour, she said, okay, fellas, that's enough. She jumps out of bed still with no clothes out, and gives us a big, both a big kiss and pushes us out the door. <laughs> that was Tallulah Banker. The story goes that Beche used to carry a handgun. Yeah, he kept it in his pocket. Probably in the places he worked, like in New York or New Orleans, it was better to carry a gun. He didn't trust banks either, so all the money he earned, he kept in this back pocket. And he kept his gun in this pocket. Or maybe it was the other way around. I can't remember. He always carried every penny he owned on him, in his pocket. So one day, when he was going out in a pub crawl, he was forever going out womanizing. He asked Roland Burkini, our bass player, to look after it. He was the most reliable of us. So he gives Burkini all his money. Well, Burkini can't sleep because we're talking millions of francs. It's like somebody saying to you, do you mind looking after this quarter of a million dollars till the morning? One night I was in Paris playing the Vieux Colombier, and I got to thinking about this story inside of me, about my grandfather. And I was asking myself, why am I here? Well, just as soon as I asked the question, I knew why. France. It's closer to Africa, and I wanted to be as close as I could. My grandfather, he was African. It was like getting back and I wanted to get back as far as I could.
there are a number of times when I'll put on some Sidney Bechet and play along with it. it it's a uh, it's good practice for me because uh, it's so demanding. You know, it's so hard to keep up with them, even in the privacy of my own room, just not to embarrass myself before myself. To just to keep up on those discs, uh, playing with them, is tough for me. And uh, and it's wonderful practice if I do that for a few days. Then I go out and play uh, in a club or something. You know, I, I feel good in the club. It's like a baseball player who swings the heavy bat. First, he swings, and then when he gets up to bat, he takes the light bat, and he feels wonderful and flexible with it. It's the same thing here. I practice all the time because I, I'm afraid if I don't, I'll lose every little bit of uh, ability I have to play. And so when I'm in a hotel, uh, I'll, I'll practice either in the car that we have. I'll go downstairs in the parked car and pull the windows closed and park on a deserted street and practice, or if I a number of times I've come back home late at night to a hotel after filming all day and I have to practice and I don't want to wake anybody in the hotel and I'll put all the covers, all the bed sheets and all the blankets over my head and play in the bed so as not to get thrown out of the hotel. <laughs> I was touring with Claude Luther in 1950 when I met my wife Elizabeth. We decided to get married in 1951 at Antibes. They recognized each other immediately, even though it was about 25 years since they'd last met. She came backstage and he started behaving like a lord. I've no idea what happened that night, but they got back together. And after 25 years, they decided to get married. Anne Vardel, the Vieux Colombier's manager, who was always on the lookout for a good publicity stunt, decided that the wedding should take place in Antibes at the reception in Juan les Pins. The mayor down there remembered how we had Mardi Gras every year in New Orleans, and we'd have this Zulu parade. Louis Armstrong happened to have been the king of Zulus a year or two before, and it was in the Time magazine and everywhere. So they asked me if I would like to be king for a year. I accepted. I phoned my fiancée, Elizabeth, and we both accepted. It was one of the biggest things that's ever been seen around there. We went round the town, and there were bands on carts, just like I remember from way back, when I used to be in the second line in New Orleans. It was really something. And I'm certainly grateful to all those people and all those musicians who made it into a day I won't ever forget. To get the mood right, Ali Badel put barrels of wine on every street corner. And there were girls walking around with buckets, drums full of rum. And everyone was allowed to help themselves to the rum and the wine. It certainly made for an interesting atmosphere, maybe a bit too much. But the wedding was a big success. Annie Bedell was happy. It must have cost a fortune. But in the end, he only paid for about a quarter of it. He was paying a little at a time and always promising to pay off the rest. I don't think he ever finished. <laughs> My father plays a clarinet, he, he's like a, a vamp, you know, really a magnificent sound. But when he touched the soprano, that, that make him uh, really, uh, uh, because he he attributed the letters of noblesse au soprano. So the soprano was qualificative to imitate the voix human in comparison to the marching band or the uh, classic. But my father did a bit like Stanley Clark with the bass, you know. Uh, oui. Amener le, les lettres de noblesse au soprano, et c'est très important. I was born in 1954, and uh, I just have memories of a child like five years old. Uh, so when, when I, I get a chance to see him, it was very rare because all the time he was on trips or uh, he came from uh, festivals or, or TV show. Uh, but uh, it was a feast. For the short time we, we, we was together, it was a feast. 
he take me in his uh, car and uh, have a good time and uh, hug me uh, hard and uh, give me a lot of gift. For me, it was a, a father like him. It was like a, a Santa Claus, you know. When he was living in Paris, he, he had two households. His newlywed wife then was on one side of Paris, and a, a young lady called Jacqueline lived with him on the other side. And he had a son by her, and we called on him once and um, walked into a, a, a huge row between him and, and Jacqueline, who was berating him because through, either through a letter in his jacket pocket or something or other, she discovered that there was a third <laughs> menage somewhere. I met Sidney in 52 in saint jean marie -Pré. The first time I met him, he offered me to to go to a concert of him, you know, and he asked him to for me to go, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, I went, and uh, I was happy to go to the to the concert, you know, and uh, with him. It was really nice. It's just like that I met him. After I had Daniel, and uh, we, we, we stayed together. We stayed together about uh, five, six years, um, just until he's dead. What about Sydney's wife, Elizabeth? How did you get on with her? I didn't meet her. I met her after Sydney died but not before, because but perhaps it was not so nice for her to see me and Danielle with, with her husband, you know. I think it was better like that. But after Sydney died, I met her, and uh, we had some uh, good relation together because she was a nice woman, and uh, she was alone, you know, and uh, she liked my son, and. Uh, why she came home sometime and we play together, or we play cars, or we play, uh, uh, oh, it's just a bit of scrabble, you know, <laughs> voila. There was this car, a Samson. It was a beautiful old French car, which cost a lot of money. In order to get Bechet to buy it, the guy who owned it had a brilliant idea. He bought a Sopranino sax, which is a lot shorter than the normal sax, and he attached it to the radiator cap. Bechet was hooked, and he bought the car. It cost the earth, but it worked on a really strange system. Automatic gears hadn't been invented yet, but in France there was a system called the Cotal gearbox, where you had to anticipate the changes. It was a kind of pre-selection. You started in first and you lifted your foot, and it went into second, and from second you did the same and it went into third. It was so difficult to work that as long as he had the car, he never managed to get it out of first gear. So of course it was goodbye the gearbox. People say you got to play the music to understand it. That isn't right. All you got to have is a love for it. I've lived for the music. I won't play it when it's wrong, but I'll play it anywhere when it's right.
It's the music and the people that's made what I got to say in this world worthwhile. And as long as I'm around, and as long as I can get the instrument up into my mouth, that's what I want to do. Now you have to understand that in France, Sidney was a king. Sidney Bechet was like a Maurice Chevalier. He was a French icon. He had children in France, he had a wife in France, he'd made all his money in France. His record company, his publishing company were in France. And in France, he was a golden man. Charles Delaunay told me Sidney was very sick. And uh, I didn't want to go see him because he had cancer. I knew he had cancer. I said, how bad is he? Oh, he's, he says, it won't be long. And I went to his bedroom, and there was this wonderful old man dying of cancer, which I hate to see. He was thin, his wrists, his arms, you know, and his, his neck. I mean, this was just the shell of a man. He was dead a couple of days later. And uh, my heart was weeping. And uh, I said, Sidney, is there anything I can do for you? He says, George, I want to go home. Take me home. I, that left an impression on me, an indelible impression, that I will never forget. Because here was a man born in New Orleans who left America because of prejudice or lack of ability to, to overcome the problems of being a black man in America as a musician, as an artist. Went to France, established everything that anyone could hope for in life. And when he was dying, he still wanted to go home. His home was not France. A musician could be playing in New Orleans, or Chicago, or New York. He could be playing in London, in Tunis, in Paris, in Germany. I heard it played in all these places and many more. But no matter where it's played, you gotta hear it starting way behind you. There's a drum beating from Congo Square right there in New Orleans. There's a song starting in the field just over the trees. A good musician, he's playing with it and he's playing after it. He's finishing something. It's a long song that started back there in the South, back there in New Orleans. Now, mesdames and messieurs, avec mon couteau suisse, my Swiss knife, we're going to cut the string and pull off this tarpaulin that belongs in my garage. We wanted to make sure the pigeons didn't dedicate it first. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Ambassador, cut the string. If you played a reed or you're trying to play a reed and then you hear him play, you know, it's, it's sort of like a different, it's like a different instrument, you know, you, you don't know why it is, you, you find yourself um, doing all the things that he did. You try and select the same reed he selected and buy the same horn he had and you hunch your shoulders the same way and blow as hard as you imagine blowing and close your eyes and, and hear what he's playing on the song in your head and, and think that you're doing it. And when yours comes out, there's nothing there. Uh, and when his comes out, it's, uh, it's just pure magic.